Well, I have already uh, been here for two hours, and I have visited the White House and paid my respects. And uh, I've been up to the Capitol, taken my 16-year-old son uh, on a quick tour, a tour of the Capitol building. And I'm now on my way back to Michigan. Well, I guess it just seems that presidential elections start so early these days. Until you look at the election of 1968. In 1967, a year before, a candidate pretty much had it in the bag, and then, well, not so much. His name was Romney. George Romney, that is. Everyone was enamored with the former chairman of American Motors, a businessman politician who had turned around a company, then spearheaded a campaign for a better education system in Michigan, one that required a constitutional convention which he led. It called for more education funding and also for more money for teachers. This from a man who would run as a Republican. And indeed he would in 1962 and turn a state, Michigan, red that had been blue for 14 years. Back then they didn't use the whole red and blue color system. But you know what I mean. Mr. Chairman, I yield 10 minutes to speak in support of this amendment to the governor of the great state of Michigan, the Honorable George Romney. He was elected in 1962 and won re-election easily in 1964 and 1966, each with an increasing margin of victory. People liked Romney. He was warm, he was jovial, and also highly moral. A devout Mormon. He did not smoke. He did not drink. He did not campaign on Sundays. He had billboards up that said, To stop crime, we must increase civility. Reporters laughed and called Romney Mr. Straight Arrow. But he was respected by them. There is a profusion of Republican, potential Republican presidential candidates running this year. We've got Romney in Michigan, Percy in Illinois, and Reagan in California. What is going to happen to the 1968 picture if all three of these men win? Uh, Bob, we're going to have an embarrassment of riches. Uh, It's really great to have uh, not only these men that you mentioned, but others. And among the many admirers he had in the early 60s was Richard Nixon, the former vice president, who said Romney had presidential timber. Well, at the time, Nixon had a law firm partnership and said he had no further interest in politics. Turned out not to be true, but it seemed like something good to say at the time. I'm going to take a holiday from politics for at least six months with no political speeches scheduled, whatever. But what the future holds, I don't know. Romney was a Republican in a heavily blue-collar state, and he made it work. On another issue, his position was clear. Romney was a supporter of civil rights. When other U.S. governors were blocking doors, preventing African Americans from higher education opportunities, Romney was appearing at civil rights rallies. This despite some opposition in his own party. Our party was founded at a time of grave national crisis. It was our mission at our birth under Lincoln to preserve this nation established by divine providence with a divine destiny. The nation and its destiny were imperiled not only by the irreconcilable conflict between slavery and freedom, but also by the extremism of that time. And the extremism and lily-white Protestantism destroyed the Whig Party and brought the Republican Party into being. The extremists of that day called themselves the sacred cult of the Star-Spangled Banner, officially. They were known popularly as the know Nothing, While their political leaders sought refuge in silence, while other political leaders did, Lincoln spoke out as forcefully against the know Nothing extremists of his day as he did about slavery. He attacked both as a violation of the source, as the source of freedom and greatness. He attacked both slavery and no-nothing extremism as a violation of the principle of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of all mankind. And had Lincoln ignored 
the know-nothing extremists of his day, he would not have been president of the United States and saved the nation. Never had a party been so badly beaten. I know that this is more than a victory of party or person. It is a tribute to the program that was begun by our beloved President John F. Kennedy. They lost by 16 million votes, with Barry Goldwater as their candidate. 16 million. Worst defeat up until that time. Thus, as the next election approached, two of the men who had tried to take the nomination from Goldwater, Nelson Rockefeller of New York and Bill Scranton of Pennsylvania, both governors, were among the many people who were against the Goldwater movement of the Republican Party, the ultra-conservative movement, and who now, in 1968, at the Miami Convention, wanted to go in a different direction. Romney made himself available to these people and immediately was the choice of the GOP governors, including Rockefeller. The other choices was the probable heir to the Goldwater support base, the conservative California governor, Ronald Reagan. But at that time, he only had two years' experience as governor, but... He had done a good job in the Goldwater campaign as a spokesperson, and he did really good in a debate against Robert F. Kennedy, really a, a talk with Robert F. Kennedy, handled questions of international journalists pretty well. Oh, and there was this surprising comeback attempt from Vice President Nixon returning to politics after he said he wouldn't. Neither of these people seemed likely to be the nominee. Romney was in a great position. This is still early. We're talking November 1966. Republicans had just had a really big midterm. Romney and friends decided to do something that is kind of common now, an early campaign, to have surrogates, the governors and other supporters, talk up Romney. And his advantage, he was charting in the polls. 1966, as we go into the early part of 1967, polls are showing him at 36% higher than any other candidate for the Republican nomination. Romney also went on an exploratory tour, hadn't announced for president yet, but he went on a tour of states in the West, not officially running, but making speeches all over. A problem that he had was that the largest issue facing America was Vietnam. Romney was a new governor with no foreign policy experience. He had, as any candidate seriously running for the presidency at this time would have to do, had visited Vietnam and had been briefed by military and diplomatic officials. The Vietnam issue was going to be the issue of 1968. Romney was asked about it constantly. He didn't say a lot, and he made the media hungry for more. So in Hartford, Connecticut, a speech was planned. And there in April 67, at the behest of Nelson Rockefeller, who was hawkish on the war, he made a speech that was also fairly hawkish on Vietnam. This surprised many of his supporters because they knew Romney to be something of a dove that really didn't think we had much business being there. But... He made a speech saying we had to stay committed since we were there. Expecting a speech bashing him by a prominent Republican candidate, Lyndon Ben Johnson was surprised and actually expressed some support for the speech that Romney made and complimented him. Not exactly a good thing to get a compliment from the guy that you're supposed to be running against next year. This is what happened to Romney, and he started to go down in the polls. Governor, uh, shifting to Vietnam in November of 1965, when you returned from Vietnam, you said, and I'm quoting, involvement was morally right and necessary and probably reversed the shift in the balance of power greater than if Hitler had conquered Europe. In recent weeks, you said uh, you didn't think we should have been involved at all and that President Johnson's decision to expand the bombing wasn't going to resolve the problem. Isn't your position uh, a bit inconsistent with what it was and what do you propose we do now? It is then that we get to a certain interview that Romney made with a journalist named Lou Gordon. Gordon was from Detroit, from Michigan, and a friend of Romney, a local TV reporter who, after a successful Detroit call-in show, now was doing a national show. Well, at least it was in three cities, Detroit, Boston, and Philadelphia. Who would he get for his big national launch, his headline show? Why, the governor of his home state, his friend, who is now attracting national news. Romney had no problem doing it, especially because Boston's TV market would help him reach New Hampshire. The show was taped on August 31st, 1967. And watching that interview, you can see how presidential Romney looked. Serious. And if you turn the volume down, this guy looked like a great possibility for the next president. If you turn the volume up and listen to the content, 
A lot of ums and ahs, a lot of very general talk, but that's not what sunk him. It was when Romney expressed some disappointment with the war in Vietnam, and Lou Gordon asked, Isn't your position a bit inconsistent with where it was, referring to the Hartford speech? Then Romney answered, Well, you know, when I came back from Vietnam, I just had the greatest brainwashing that anybody can get. When you, by the generals? When you go over to Vietnam, well, not only by the generals, but also by the diplomatic uh, corps over there. And uh, they, they do a very thorough job. I just had the greatest brainwashing. After that, I looked into the history and I changed my mind. I no longer believe that it was necessary to get involved in South Vietnam. Uh, I have changed my mind uh, in that particular. That line, the greatest brainwashing, brainwashing, a few seconds on TV, became the headline in the New York Times the day after it was cast. It wasn't an amazing discovery of the newspaper. Lou Gordon, looking for the Gray Lady's publicity, had actually sent advance transcripts over to reporters there and alerted him that when he taped, Romney had said something about being brainwashed about Vietnam. Great thing to do to a friend, huh? Right here is where the Democrats, oddly enough, probably ensured that Richard Nixon would get the nomination and then the presidency. John Bailey, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, could not resist pouncing at a major Republican Kennedy. He said of Romney, he has insulted the integrity of respected men like General Westmoreland and Ambassador Henry Cabot Lodge. Robert McNamara joined. He said Romney had no idea what he was talking about. It's one of those things. Sure, he wasn't referring to real brainwashing. He was referring to a group of people giving him one side of the story, which he bought into, and when he did more investigation, he saw the other side of the story. That's not what he said. By the time you get to New Hampshire 1968, Nixon has six times the support of Romney. Rockefeller now hints that even though he supports Romney, he might run if drafted. Romney campaigns and campaigns all through New Hampshire actually goes from 12% to 7%, drops out of the race before the New Hampshire primary. That wasn't quite the end. George Romney became Secretary of Housing and Urban Development for Richard Nixon. There he tried to introduce programs to increase housing for the poor using assembly techniques from the car industry. Knowing that the president would be opposed, for several months in secret, he had the Department of Housing and Urban Development develop a open communities plan that would help to desegregate public housing. This meant opposition from the public and from the president. Nixon stalled everything that Romney came up with, tried to get rid of him, asking him to run for the U.S. Senate seat in Michigan. No, Romney said he'd keep his HUD position. His wife would run. His wife lost the race. Then Nixon tweaked, installed every program he did, hoping he'd quit. And eventually, right after Nixon's re-election, Romney did. Wasn't without any good. There are some who say that all the standards that we see in public housing today were you know, the result of Romney influencing the requirement that smoke alarms be in housing units. George encouraged his son, Mitt, to be involved in politics and to challenge Ted Kennedy in 1994 as a big influence there. So 
Talking about George Romney and his short non-run for the presidency is useful to understand a little bit about Romney's motivation. It's also interesting, if you remove the last name of who we're talking about, to see politics happen so early in a race, to see where the early look of the campaign, most likely being Romney taking on Lyndon Baines Johnson for the presidency, didn't turn out to be what did happen. That can be instructive. I want to thank you for listening to the website. It's myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. And if you do like the program, please tell someone about it. Thanks for listening.